Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore and welcome to the Music Masterclass. So uh, we've been talking a bit about SATB music, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and I'll definitely be talking about that more today and looking at some music that people have been submitting. Um, uh, for people who are new, welcome. Uh, and if you're not new, welcome. This uh, class is a regular weekly thing I do on Thursdays, a live stream brought to you by the Mastering Music Score School, where I have my online courses that give you a kind of really structured approach to learning. So I've got that link pinned up uh, to the top of the chat. By all means, check out my Harmony course, my CounterPoint course. They're both very relevant to the things that we'll be talking about over the next few weeks here. So, uh, you know, know what's going on here. So, um, I also uh, mentioned, I don't know how many of you follow uh, my Twitter feed. I don't post much. Basically, I just post notice, notices of uh, my my live streams uh, like an hour ahead of time. But uh, there's a bassist in uh, Denver uh, named Paul Warburton who just died last night. And he is someone who was really quite instrumental in my own musical development, my own understanding of harmony, and I'll talk about uh, talk about that a little bit. Talk about uh, what <laughs> what I managed to learn just from listening to a bass player play um, about harmony, because it's not like he was ever my teacher or anything. But how much it's possible to learn by listening and interacting with other musicians. So um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I will jump over to that at some point. So. One thing that I want to do for anyone who hasn't uh, been kind of following what's going on is make sure that you all know about also my community site. The, the community site is where uh, we post our music to, uh, to get comments and so forth, and I definitely encourage people to comment on each other's music because ideally we get too much music for me to talk about. Um, and uh, so what I want to do is take a look at some of the, the pieces that have been uh, posted here. And um, so Rod, I don't, let me, let me check to see if your piece has uh, managed to get, because uh, I, I remember one of yours uh, I wasn't able to download when I tried. Um, oh, no, that was a different one. Uh, I'm confused. Um in any case, I'm going to take a take another look at this in a second here um, and see what you've got going uh, now because I had given you some feedback earlier. But I'm going to take a look at, uh, you know, some other stuff that's been uh, submitted here. And um, I guess the first thing that I want to do is talk a bit about SATB writing in general. So for those of you who are um, All Access members, you you've may have already seen that I posted this video. I, I'm never sure how, how well the notifications go out, but in on the community site, in the uh, director's chair area here for uh, All Access members, um, I uh, posted a video, like a really, really, really short uh, version of talking about that just to give you some more uh, context on what I'm talking about. So this, some of you may remember two years ago, uh, well, well, two years and a couple months ago, I, I did a, a, a fall or autumn challenge and just basically had people write songs about fall. That was the idea, or songs about autumn. I know the word fall is kind of a United States thing. Um, but, uh, and so we had a lot of people creating songs about autumn and, you know, either taking existing ones, setting them to music and so forth. And although it didn't specifically have to be SATB, didn't have to be anything, it wasn't a competition, um, I was definitely uh, in that world then. My piece is quite short. Um, and so I'm just going to play it for you and then talk about some of the aspects of, uh, of what's going on here. So this is... Uh, um, my piece, Autumn Fires, and it, it's been on my mind because, of course, we had forest fires in Colorado uh, last week. Uh, the, uh, well, forest fires, it wasn't really the forest, right? It was the towns on fire. Um, so anyhow, it's been on my mind. So let's uh, hear this piece, and then I'll just talk briefly about it, and then we'll jump into looking at some of your music. Thank you. 
All right, so that is the piece. And um, uh, it's it, to me, it exemplifies a lot of things about what we mean when we talk about SATB writing. So just to, to give a, a, just a quick overview of what's going on, it is for four voices, or you know, a choir in which the choir is divided into four sections, sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses. And uh, so it could literally be sung by just four people. I would say sometimes when I'm writing for uh, SATB, I think of it that way. I think of it as literally just four people singing. Sometimes when I'm writing, I, uh, I'm thinking of it as a choir with a lot of people on that soprano part, a lot of people on that alto part. And uh, I don't necessarily have a clear way I could describe how I know when I'm doing one or the other or what I do differently. So those of you who do a lot of choral music, whether it's writing it or singing it, feel free to uh, jump in on, on the chat here and just give your thoughts about that. What's What to you might feel different about writing for just literally a quartet of four voices versus a choir in which it's divided in four parts? Because, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious how other people think of that. So, yeah, this is for four voices, but not all four voices all the time, right? It starts with just the men and in unison, right? So I'm not always using a full four-voice texture. Once I get all four voices in, though, I'm mostly four voices, but yeah, I, let it, I let it thin out in places. By not having the bass in for that part, I, I achieve a, a slightly different texture. Pleasant summer, right? That's like pleasant. I, I didn't. I, I didn't. I'm. I'm trying to do a little bit of uh, thinking. Thinking about the uh, uh, meaning of the words in how I uh, how I'm arranging the music here, or how I'm you know how I'm voicing my chords, how I'm everything about what I'm doing. I'm trying to think some about the actual uh, poem that I'm setting here. It's a poem. In case you didn't notice, Robert Louis Stevenson uh, wrote the poem, and I just set it to music. So. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's four voices throughout, and it's mostly what you would call chorale style, meaning you have passages like this one here, all voices in exactly the same rhythm, right? That's the typical hymn type of uh, arrangement. Chorale is maybe a more general term for that type of thing. It's got other meanings too, but for my purposes here, if I talk about chorale style, that's what I mean. I mean all the voices in the same rhythm. I would contrast that with things like this, where some voices have the same rhythm, but another voice is moving. In the bass, right? And that's kind of throughout here. The melody is mostly half notes, but I, you don't necessarily want the entire arrangement to come to a standstill just because the melody has long notes. So you let some other voice carry some motion. Now, if you're writing for SATB and piano or other accompaniment, then the other instruments can uh, provide that accompaniment for sure. Um, and so you can just have all the voices sing a whole note and, you know, your piano accompaniment or whatever other kind of instrumental accompaniment you have might carry the rhythm going. Or maybe you don't, maybe you've come to a whole note and you want the music to feel like it stops. But that's not usually the case, right? Usually there might be a, a whole note in the middle of a melody somewhere, and it doesn't make sense that the entire rhythm of the arrangement should stop just because the melody happened to have a long note. So normally when the melody has long notes, if you're writing a unaccompanied SATB, some other instrument is going to carry some motion. But then you sort of try to manage how much of that motion there is because you don't necessarily want that other motion to become more important than the melody itself. And the melody is usually on top other than barbershop. We talked a little bit about barbershop, I think, last week. But in barbershop uh, harmony, very specifically, the melody is generally the second to top voice. So I see some comments coming in here. Oh, yeah. So, so Dean, did you... Did you watch my video or did you notice those yourself? There are, in, in fact, parallel fifths and parallel octaves in here, absolutely. And to be honest, 
In the video that I did, I surprised myself in how many of them there were. I knew when I wrote this that I wasn't like writing it as an academic exercise. And the thing is, the harmonic language here is not is not the harmonic language of just triads and the type of music for which rules about parallel fifths and octaves came about. So I don't consider it vitally important. But frankly, I was surprised at how many parallelisms slipped in. Um, so, but let me take a look at the particular one you're talking about, bar five. Uh, so you're seeing this guy right here. Yep, this one also has parallel octaves for what it's worth, D to D and C to C. So what I say about this in, in the video that I recorded and what I will stand by partially <laughs> is um, the textures here, if you think about it, we have, ah, I gotta turn my keyboard on. <laughs> that, was, that was disappointing. Um, well, let me just play it here. It's going from a minor chord with a, an added ninth to a triad, and then a triad, and then, I can't reach this, but a major seventh chord. Those changes of texture, to me, obliterate the whatever negative effect parallel fifths or parallel octaves might have had, because suddenly we are introducing enough variety. The whole reason why parallel fifths and parallel octaves are things you're supposed to avoid is they, they thin out the texture too much. It makes it sound like there's only three things going on instead of four. But I would claim that my harmonic stuff here, what's going on, makes that less of an issue. Someone else might disagree and say no, and realistically, yeah, I could probably rewrite this to eliminate those, but I'm really aware of that parallel fifth when I wrote it and decided to accept it because it's going from this G is the uh, the fifth of a C chord and the B and the A is the major seventh of a B flat chord. That's a significant change of role for that note. And to me, in some way, that mitigates the fact that there's a, a thinning of the texture because of two voices moving together. It's a very subjective thing, and uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's right to think about those issues, and then you trust your ears based on what's actually going on. So, oh, good, Rod, you got, uh, you got uh, something uploaded. Um, and, uh, oh, that's a good point, Graham, about um, uh, complex music leaving voices exposed. And uh, so the more complex the thing is, um, for amateur singers, having a choir and other people to lean on uh, would be effective. For uh, the, uh, the, flip si the flip side of that also could be, now you're depending on lots of people being able to handle that complex music, but hopefully some of them can just sort of ride the coattails of the others. But it's, it's easy to put together, not easy, but much more practically possible to put together a professional quartet of four really good readers who aren't going to be thrown by stuff. Because this is not an easy piece to sing. My harmonic language here is quite, um, what is it? It's, it's, it's definitely, um, it's not jazz. It's, it's, it's got this late romantic thing going on in terms of my use of some of the sonorities. I think you'll notice there's a Neapolitan in there. There's some augmented sixth chords. And there's things like these added ninths, which, OK, that's a jazzism, I guess. Um, and that major seventh chord. But it's not mostly a jazz type of harmony. But it is definitely much more harmonically rich than uh, than simpler <laughs> choral music. And so this would not be easy for a lot of people to sing. Uh, in particular, the inner voices have tricky uh, chromaticisms to sing, like this little line here for the alto. I'm not saying that that's impossible to sing. I'm saying it's a little tricky, just the, the combinations of whole steps and half steps, or maybe uh, this little line right here. is not impossible. You can learn it, but it is a little tricky. Um, so uh, anyhow, that's these are all things you think about when you're writing SATB. So um, yeah, if you're if you're Eric Whitaker, you do what you want, and it's going to sound great if you're if you're uh, Eric Whitaker. So um, 
yeah, Eric is definitely one of the sort of modern masters of this type of writing. And realistically, things like that sound that I just talked about, this chord with the added ninth, I mean, that is Eric Whitaker City, right? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not super familiar with his music. I, I, I know it a little bit, and I hear those types of sonorities all the time. It's coming from a classical tradition, but it's using sonorities like that one. Or, for that matter, this little thing right here. Right? We start with a D, and then the voices kind of peel off away from each other. That is such a modern choral cliche, and I bet Eric Whitaker has written that a thousand times. Or maybe he avoids it because it's such a cliche that he goes out of his way to avoid it. <laughs> but it's it's definitely a big part of that language. And I, I felt a little guilty about starting the piece off that way, frankly, because it is such a modern choral cliche. But I like it. Sue me. Okay. So, um, yeah, good point, Rod. In, in uh, Barbershop, the baritone is usually the one with the trickiest uh, lines. And realistically, it's the, sopran it's the altos and the tenors, the inner voices, who usually get the trickiest lines in, in any form of music, the inner voices. But except in Barbershop, where the alto voice, the second to top voice, is the melody. So I've talked a bunch about harmony here, and I say I want to talk a little bit about Paul Warburton, um, but I'm going to put that off so we can hear uh, Graham's uh, Sunrise Sunset here, which is, is really lovely, and, and um, I gave some comments, or did I? Maybe I, I withheld the comments because I was going to talk about it here. But let's listen to uh, Graham's uh, uh, Sunrise Sunset arrangement here, okay? Oh, good. I had it off. Yeah, sorry about that. I usually uh, turn off repeats and couldn't remember if I had them off just, just because, you know, we, uh, um, as love, <laughs> that was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. But um, for, you know, for the sake of being able to give commentary, I feel like we don't need to hear repeats on things. But yeah, that is, that is a, Gorgeous, gorgeous arrangement. I love the piece and and love what you've done with it. So, um, I'm th there's there's all sorts of wonderful things that I'm going to talk about here, and then like you know two or three things that I would say yeah maybe think about this here. Um, so, this idea of starting off a piece simply, right? And by simply, I mean it's just the melody in unison and just the upper voices, usually the women, right? Soprano and alto. Um, I mean, you might have some, you know, if it's a children's choir, you might have boys being altos, or if it's just a particularly high-voiced man, then they might sing an alto part. But 
the the general assumption is women on are soprano and altos, men are tenors and basses. So the women only on on the very first line. And I think that actually goes with how the the arrangement in the show went, but I could I could be wrong. Um, so uh, um, the uh, the idea that it's just unison, there's no harmony in the vocal parts, and it's only the women gives it a very simple feel with very simple accompaniment, and then it's amazingly effective how when the full choir comes in, it just sort of explodes in, uh, in um, richness. Oh yeah, also he switches between just the, the women and now the men. And then exploding into four-part harmony. Right, so that is, is it's it's similar to what I showed at the beginning of Autumn Fires. It's just a great technique. Use it. It's it's great. Uh, I'm not saying you have to use it, but I encourage it. The other thing, though, that's going on here is not just that it's exploding into four part harmony. There's a little more than that. There's um actually there's something weird here. I see a comment about stems, and uh, there's something. Uh, um, yes, definitely double stems is, is voices one and two. That's what they are for. So uh, when you're writing four-part harmony on two staves, which is a great way of doing it, voice one, stem up, voice two, stem down. So sopranos will be stem up, altos will be stem down. On the bottom staff, uh, tenors will be stem up, voice one. Basses will be stem down, voice two. Do not make the mistake of thinking, oh, tenor and bass, that's voice three and four. No, start over with voice one on two, voice one and two on every staff. Otherwise, you have all these extra rests that you don't need, and it uh, makes everything about editing the music uh, more complicated than need be. So always voice one and two for each staff. So there is some sort of weird glitch thing here where I see the stem here. So it looks like he has uh, um, this note here doubled or something. Because uh, it looks like maybe, well, let me just take this note down an octave. Yeah, so he's got actually two uh, C's there. He's got the C in both parts. So I'm going to take that to be kind of a typo and eliminate that. All right, so the point that I actually wanted to make here, though, is that it doesn't actually split into four-part harmony right away because this first voicing, this tenor note there, G, is the same as the melody note, G. So this is a case where it's really three-part harmony um, because there's a doubling, not just doubling at an octave, but doubling at the same pitch. There's also a voice crossing going on here where the uh, the tenor is actually higher than the alto. And it's interesting because in the video that I did uh, yesterday, uh, I talk about how that's usually something you don't do, but if there's a particular reason, go ahead. I think here's a particular reason because he wanted all four voices within this small space between C and G. He wanted all four voices. And I guess he could have doubled the E flat to do that, C and E flat, and then E flat and G. Or, but he wanted to double the G as the melody note, which I think was a fine choice, and uh, decided to do that by giving uh, female and male voices that same note. So that, that that those are all good reasons, and whether or not that was the thinking, it works for me. So. Um, uh, so that, that, that is kind of my thinking about maybe what, what you're doing. And Graham, feel free to uh, correct me. But in any case, this is really a three-part voicing. But then it expands whoops, to a four-part voicing. Um, I had to make sure there wasn't an A-flat in the key signature. Um, but uh, I know it was in G minor, but just wanted to make sure. Um, so this voicing here now is a four-part voicing, but the upper... Uh, it's, it's what's called a close position voicing in, in the upper voices. They're all within um, an octave of each other. You can't play a C, an A, and an E flat closer together than that, right? And then the next voicing is also um, close position in the upper voices, E flat, C, and G. You can't play those three notes closer together. An open voicing, by the way, would be this, E flat, G, and C. He could have written that, but he's kept it 
close position on top while moving the base down. So it has some of that same feel as that peel off thing that I talked about in my Autumn Fires piece. That right that same idea of starting together and peeling up it's basically contrary motion but it's contrary motion in such a way that it expands the range of the voices um which i guess contrary loading it's not an instant explosion it's a kind of a feel and i i just love it um and then he keeps the contrary motion going through here and here's a good example of what I was talking about of the, uh, the the value of having accompaniment because the melody stops, right? The melody just has dotted half note, 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 tied to another dot. Right, that's a lot of not moving much. But rather than let the voices have to carry all that motion, which in an a cappella arrangement, probably you would. You wouldn't want the whole motion of the piece to stop there. By using accompaniment, he's able to keep motion going. And it's just very simple. Boom. And that's a kind of a consistent motion that kind of uh, goes throughout the piece. This uh, quadruplet here is a nice way of kind of breaking things up. I like that. Yeah, I like that. That was a nice little. That was a nice little addition there. So cool. Um, so uh, so there you go. And um, yeah, so th we see those same devices used in other places. And uh, I this is like the one place where he is using the voices to create some motion where the melody didn't have it. Right by giving them these la la las. So. So, right, he could have done the la 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 in the piano. Now, one thing I will say about this is not being uh, like, I mean, yeah, I'm not a singer, right? Obviously, I don't sing in choirs. I'm a little uncomfortable with that repeated C. Like, everyone else gets to move. And. Um, but this voice here, just going, na, 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 na. Um, I'm not saying it's not singable. Of course it is. But there's something about it that I wonder if it would come off as a little distracting um, in hearing. Because hearing mu score playback is different than hearing human voices and, and recognizing that it's literally the same people singing that tenor part line like that. I don't know. that It might be more effective to give them just a dotted half note, I don't know, but uh, I'm happy to be educated on that and uh, and maybe hear hear it both ways. Now, this is the great thing. A lot of the choral writing I did was when I was working on my composition degree. Oh, this would be a nice segue to talking about Paul. Um, so I, you know, I have an actual master's degree in composition, and in that experience of working on the degree, I had the opportunity to write. Uh, for lots of different ensembles and have that music performed and often got to work with the ensemble while they were rehearsing the music so I could either give them feedback on how they were interpreting my stuff, but also they could give me feedback on what I wrote and what worked, or maybe they wouldn't verbalize the feedback. I would just hear it. Oh, that thing that sounded really nice in at the time I was using Finale, that thing that sounded really nice in Finale's playback doesn't work so well in real life, or occasionally the other way around. Um, so, uh, um, the thing, there's a, a random thing that I just noticed here that I thought I noticed before. These are on the wrong side. Arpeggio symbols go on the left. So it looks like you manually put that there. Don't. Reset it. It goes, it goes in front of the note. Um, otherwise it's not, because there was a place where I saw it and I was like, well, why is he only putting an arpeggio on the second chord, not the first one? Because when I see this arpeggio symbol here, I assume it applies to the next chord. And so I would have played that as and then come to the last arpeggio symbol and going, what is this doing here? It's not applying to anything. And only then would I have realized, oh, you've got your arpeggios backwards. So in any case, uh, I would reset your arpeggios. And by the way, I can do that right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna right click one, select all similar elements, control R. Here we go. Now they're all where they belong. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know, Graham. Uh, I'm just saying that that was a, a thing that jumps out at me as, I don't know. 
Um, I'm not saying definitely a problem. It's a it's it's one of those things that I would listen for in an actual rehearsal um, with real musicians to see how I felt about it. It's it, there's sort of a red flag there. Now here, getting back to the discussion about parallel octaves. <laughs> that's not parallel octaves. That's not a problem. That's doubling. That's doubling that line in two voices. There's nothing wrong with doubling an entire line like that. The thing about parallel octaves has more to do with like accidental cases where, oh, this one extra note snuck in this one place where two voices had two notes in a row that were the same pitch or that were a fifth apart and you didn't do it on purpose and it wasn't part of a whole texture. So in my counterpoint course, I go on about that and I give examples of, um, you know, Beethoven writing, or I don't remember what the actual piece was. It was from one of his piano sonatas, I think, but it was like, all right, I'm just making up something that was vaguely similar to that. It was something between the two voices that had some counterpoint to it, and then a little passage where both voices were in unison. Yeah, you do that, that's fine. So this is fine. Now I would say doing it in octaves like that, great idea. Had you decided, hey, what if I do this in fifths? I would say that probably doesn't work so well because probably those perfect fifths parallel like that, those are not gonna sound as good. And I make that point in the counterpoint course also when I'm talking about parallels, that parallel doubling in octaves happens all the time. Actually voicing something in parallel fifths on purpose, that is that is a sound. And it's a sound associated with rock and roll, right? I always use this as an example. Uh, oh yeah, I, I want to hold your hand. Starts right off with these you know, power chords there. And Bela Bartok, I, I think I have a Bela Bartok example in my counterpoint course where he's deliberately writing parallel fifths in the left hand um, as, a, as a, a specific texture. So yeah, it's good that you didn't fill out that chord with that, I would say. All right, so um, uh, the, other, the other thing that I would say about the texture changes in here, I love that there are the texture changes that it goes back to a cappella at this point. Or back to, did it even ever? No, that's actually the first a cappella. Uh, and by the way, when I use that word, I mean unaccompanied. Um, so this is... Now, unaccompanied, right? And the thing is, it's not as dramatic, noticeable of a change in Muse Scores playback. I think in a real performance, it would be more noticeable. I also think you could probably increase that contrast by giving the piano something to do all the way to the bar line. Maybe give the piano some of that motion so that it's dropping out is more noticeable. But having the motion in the voices already is, is, is some of that also. This is another one of those things where I'd need to hear it with the real instruments and the real voice to know. But anyhow, I love how now it's just the voices. So I love that it's split into just the voices and then go and then the accompaniment comes back. The similar comment that I made about maybe think about having the piano have some motion all the way to the bar line to make it that much more dramatic, I have a similar feeling, or maybe the opposite feeling here. I feel like, uh, kind of speaking to what I've been talking about, some when there's long notes, maybe having something move. Um, right here, the only thing moving is that B flat, right? Going from minor to major, or minor seventh to dominant seventh. I I personally feel like I could use some more motion in here. So what I might think about is adding just something in the piano accompaniment to create a little more momentum into the downbeat there. So, you know, something like that. I don't know. Um, uh, or have the actual basses sing that. I don't, I don't know. Maybe not, but th that was the part that felt like not much happening. But there's other things you could do just within the voices. Like, for instance, this seventh doesn't need to be there right away. You could let it be... So I let different voices move at different times. So I let the tenor have a G, and then G, F, B, and then A, B, 
would you actually ask a tenor to sing that A flat? I probably wouldn't. But um, um, but you know, whatever. Some something like that because that A flat is a flat nine, beautiful sound. Um, by just having a slight bit more motion, and because actually that that. Even aside from the motion question, that seventh there feels a bit abrupt to me. And this sounds weird coming from me as a jazz person using seventh on all my chords. Somehow that's, maybe it's the fact that it's just sitting there and a rest of the piece is more triadic. That seventh just feels a little think about. And then there was one other place where there was a similar thing. I think it was here. want motion to just stop there maybe but that i guess that's one of the other things that i would think about if that's absolutely what you want go for it if you're at all unsure i would give you uh, encouragement to consider other options for just that spot and then of course this is the same thing as before so anyhow those were like the only things that as i listened to made me think uh, i wonder if there was some other way of approaching this uh, everything else about the piece, I was like, yeah, I, I wish I had done this. It's beautiful. Um, so, um, so yeah, great job, Graham. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't write that A flat, but on the other hand, you could totally have this, the alto do that. Um, now some people will tell you that interval, um, is not one to sing. B to A flat. It's an augmented second, and the uh, the check harmony rules plug in that I actually run during the course of that video I mentioned, the all access member video, uh, identifies that as a like no no. But it's not a don't ever do it. It's a think about it. It makes it a little awkward to sing, but eh, it's it's not that big of concern, especially in music like this. So. Um, so that talk about sevenths here and flat nines again brings me back to harmony, and I do want to talk a little bit about the 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 harmon the harmonic things that I have been alluding to and about this bassist Paul Warburton, and just tell you a little bit about him and his influence on me. Um, so yeah, again, Graham, beautiful piece, and uh, yeah, great job. Um, so Paul is a bassist, uh, and again, he just died last uh, last night, and he had been in hospice for a while. We knew we knew this was coming, but it was still, you know, kind of hard. Uh, he's not, like, super famous. Probably not many people outside Colorado know Paul. Um, but, because he lived, uh, I actually don't know if he grew up here or not. Uh, I should know that, but I don't. But he... Uh, he is extremely well regarded in the area and is one of those people who like plays with all, like anytime any of the musicians would come through town and needed to like jazz musicians come through town and need to pick up a local rhythm section he was always one of the the first people you'd want to pick and one of those people was Bill Evans so Paul got to play with Bill Evans in the 60s there's unfortunately to my knowledge, no recorded evidence of that but um but Paul got to play with Bill Evans and went on tour with him briefly um uh, through San Francisco. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and that gives you an idea of how long Paul was around. He was uh, someone who was being, you know, was already at a high professional level in the mid-60s. I actually think maybe they met in San Francisco, so don't try, don't, don't, I'm not the historian here. So anyhow, Paul uh, was definitely, you know, sort of one of the elder statesmen statesman of music uh, when I was, you know, I was a computer science major and, and uh, um, math major and worked at Hewlett Packard uh, for a number of years before deciding to do music full time. And, and then I started doing music full time and was playing around and teaching some and, you know, uh, thought things were fine. And Anyone who ever bought my Harmony book that I wrote like 20 years ago uh, and read the preface, I, t I tell this story of how I came to write this Harmony book, and Paul Warburton is instrumental in that story. So I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I will tell you a couple of specific things that had to do with him. One was playing, uh, playing a gig where we were playing a song, and I think the song was Angel Eyes, I believe, and we came to the bridge, and we were playing it in a different time signature and a different key than than normal, and we came to the bridge, and we didn't have sheet music. I was just sitting in with the band, I think, actually, and they said, oh, we're going to do Angel Eyes in G minor in 3-4. Can you hang? I'm like, 
sure? And the answer was no. <laughs> Every time we came to the bridge, I could not find the first chord. And Paul would just kind of glare at me and try to play it for me. And eventually, I think I got it. But um, it was it was a moment of embarrassment realizing, yeah, they, these, these older guys know some stuff that I don't know because they knew how to just transpose and, and do these things. And I was working on that skill. And I got better at it. And later on, I got to do a gig with Paul, and we were doing another song. I think it might have been uh, You Don't Know What Love Is. And there was a point where he was making all these chord substitutions, and I had gotten, I had developed my ear in the intervening couple of years since then, um, in part because of that experience of being having this impetus, oh, I need to learn some stuff. Um, but then uh, also some other stuff that I talk about in, in the preface to that book. But um, I, I worked on a lot of things and really developed my ear and my, my uh, ear for harmony and my knowledge of harmony through self-study, basically. Uh, and that's, and developed some of my own approaches that I eventually came to realize this is how those people who didn't learn harmony from books but learned it by playing on the bandstand my approach is basically distilling their approach. So some of the stuff, those of you who did the Jazz Piano Holiday and saw me talking about breaking uh, songs up into like, oh, let's identify the basic harmony, the ones and the five, the ones and the fours and the fives, and then add two fives and then substitute other idioms. This is how traditionally jazz musicians develop harmony. And not just jazz musicians, but in anyone composing also trying to compose harmonies from to relatively simple melodies and then put harmonies on top of them. And Paul, so one of the other, um, uh, one of the other uh, things that I got from Paul really relates directly to that. And it was a time when I wasn't playing with him. I was just listening. I was just, uh, you know, listening to him play uh, at a at a club uh, in Boulder, and um, the, no, it wasn't in Boulder. It was in Greeley, um, but yeah, here in Colorado, and uh, it was with a quartet. And I remember as they were playing, uh, they were playing songs that I knew, and every time they came to a specific place in a song, Paul did a pretty specific thing. And I'm going to show this to you. And I'm going to say that this is like, this was like one of the biggest light bulb moments of my life. I, and I don't, I, I, it's not going to sound like that big when I talk about it here. But um, uh, in the, uh, in the Jazz Piano Holiday course, I talked about uh, cadences and pre-cadences and static progressions. This is the moment at which that thought started to crystallize in my mind. Because those are not terms that you hear every day. Um, certainly not pre-cadence. Cadence, yes. Static progression or turnaround, yeah, kind of. But the idea of the pre-cadence, the idea of a progression to get you from one to two. So the example that I would give is... Um, uh, whatever. It's uh, if we have a one chord, I'm gonna play in C major. Um, I just made up a little melody. I don't know why I couldn't think of a melody that I actually wanted to play, but that's the way my melody. All on the one chord, and then a quick two, five, one. All right. So say that that was a song that you knew. Every time a section of a song would come up like that, where I knew it as something simple, like just two measures of the one chord, and then two, five, one. Or maybe I knew it as one, five, one. Maybe that's how I knew it. Every time that happened, Paul would play this. That exact bass line. One. I'll sing it in an octave I can sing it in. One, four, three, six, two. That exact bass line. And you could watch his fingers sliding on the strings. And you know, I the, the physical sensation of seeing how his fingers always made the same physical pattern, because of course bass is tuned in fourths, so to go from C to F is really just to move uh from one string to another, and then slide down to there. I'm, I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. One second. Or I'm not. 
<coughs> Sorry about that. I should have uh, muted first. Um, but there was like hearing that sound of boom, do, 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 and hearing that little melody. That's a melody. And it's not like I had never heard 1, 4, 3, 6 before, but it had never occurred to me that 1, 4, 3, 6 was one of these pre preset pre-composed little chord progressions that you could plug in to almost any song. Any song that starts with a one chord and then two measures later gets you to the two chord. Or two measures later is on a five chord. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of an example. But uh, like the Jingle Bells is the one I just did, right? So I'll do that. And, so, and now if I wanted to go to a two chord next. Fine. Well, instead of just staying on one, I could go and turn it into one, four, three, six. That idea that one, four, three, six was like this super powerful thing that could just be plugged in anytime you came to that section of a tune. And again, these were songs that I knew, but I knew them with different chord progressions. I didn't know them with one, four, three, six. I knew them as just one, or one, then six, or one, and then, and then, and maybe I knew it with a diminished chord, or there were different chords that I knew that for a particular song, this song you use that diminished chord there. This song you have to use that chord. This was the first time I became aware, no, you can really plug in that entire four chord segment, you rip out all the chords that were there, plug in those four chords, if it works with the melody. It doesn't always work with the melody, but it often does. And so just sitting there listening to Paul plug in those one, four, three, sixes, it was, yeah, like light bulb went off and exploded in my mind of, oh my gosh, there's, I, I gotta, I gotta play with this idea. And that was like this huge turning point in my thinking about harmony, realizing how much of it was about these idioms as I talk about. So, um, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Let me uh, put Paul's name in the chat. Uh, here we go. Paul Warburton. So there you go. Yeah, and he's got like one CD out under his own name, um, uh, but he's played on a bunch of other people's things. And yeah, outside of Denver, outside of Colorado, he is not super well known. Although there's this guy I know, a bassist in uh, in Kansas City, actually who, you know, came across Paul somewhere when one of them was touring and, and heard the other play. And uh, um, and so he was like the world's biggest Paul Warburton fan. And, and uh, he's like one person I knew who like, like would travel to Denver just to come hear Paul play. Um, so anyhow, uh, this idea that you can um, uh, plug and play bits of harmony are, it's... An powerful device that jazz musicians use um, and uh, we, we use this to reharmonize pieces on the fly because you don't have to pre-work this stuff out once you reach the right level and I want to show you an example of this. This was my favorite Paul Warburton moment playing with him and I'm going to do my best to recreate it here. I didn't have time to think through this first. I just know what I want to re recreate. I meant you don't um, and I haven't played it in probably 10 years, but I think I remember it well enough. And part of the reason I know it well enough, I think I'm going to be able to play it here, is because of my ability to see chunks of information. 1, 4, 3, 6 isn't four separate chords. It's one chunk of information. 1, 4, 3, 6. Right? It's a thing. pre -K. Ability to chunk chord progressions or, or you know, sections of music in that you can see as one unit rather than individual little things to be memorized separately. That's not easy. But seeing one unit and then how they logically fit together. This pre-cadence is going to be followed by a cadence. And it's not four random chords that make up your pre-cadence and then three random chords making up your cadence. It's pre-cadence, cadence. And of course, after pre oh, uh that's uh, so you don't know minor because I think that's kind of the common key. One of the other things that comes from this is you end up playing songs in different keys to accommodate different singers, and you forget what the usual key is. And usual, schmoozual, it's like different, every, different people play things in different keys, and that's the way it is. Um, but... This C 
sequence that I just played, that sequence of uh, uh, Circle of Fifths. F minor, B flat seven, E flat minor, A flat seven. I think I got that from Paul. I can't prove it. And when I say I got it from Paul, I don't mean like I never played the Circle of Fists before. I mean applying it to that spot of that song, because I think the original sheet music that I learned it from, or lead sheet that I learned it from, wasn't that. And then you have another A section. That's just a funny chord that I put in, because I like it. So that's the second A section. Then we have the bridge. And this is the part where if you don't get the first chord right, you're kind of hosed. And it's either this, which it isn't. And that's the kind of mistake that I used to make and still make sometimes. But now I know how to get myself out of that hole. Because now I know it's really this. It's a 2-5-1. It's a modulation to another key. And I hear it. It's going to a flatter key. So, well, is it flatter? I don't know. It's, it's, it's going to, from F minor to A flat major is really just the relative major, so it's not really flatter. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know, it's got a flat note in the melody. I, I, I don't know. It, it, I can't put into words what I hear, but I knew there were only two choices. It was either going from F minor, it's either going to D flat major, or it's going to A flat major. My ear can tell the dip, that those two are similar. And you might think, oh, they're not similar at all. One is up and the other is down. Yeah, but they're adjacent on the circle of fifths. And that is how we generally perceive key changes in terms of distance on the circle of fifths. If instead of going to there, it had gone, uh, so here's going to A flat, I'm going to now go to A. different it sounded going to A versus A flat. They're right next to each other as keys go, but on the circle of fifths, they're like almost all the way distant apart. That's the kind of thing you can <laughs> learn to tell the difference between. These are all the things that I learned. Everything that I'm talking about, I'm not saying, oh, Paul taught me that, Paul taught me that, but these are all things that I became aware of um, through the self-study that I went into as a result of things like that experience I had where I was playing wrong chords and Paul kept glaring at me. Um, he had a glare. Man, did he have a glare. Um, but he was a great guy. Uh, so anyhow, the bridge to that song, uh, I'm going to now show you what the, my favorite Paul Warburton moment was. Um, so I have... Uh, then... to A flat. And then to F7. Okay, so just a simple little chord progression. Two, five, one, six. Or however the melody goes exactly. Um, Do you know how a lost heart yearns? No, I, I, I think I, those are the wrong lyrics. Um, um, so uh, that's the usual chord progression, just two, five, one, six, two, five, one, six. I was playing this on a gig with Paul, and he did the following. Now, could you hear what I did there? I went two, five, one. No, I didn't do that. I went two, Five, but instead of resolving to one, this is a flat seven going to six. Now, as substitutions go, it's not every day that you can take a one chord and replace it with a flat seven chord. It has everything to do with the context there, the fact that a six chord is coming next. Um, so the fact that the six chord was coming next. So the other thing that I could have done, the simpler substitution, would have been two, five, 
to three, three, six. Because three going to six is a common thing. And then once you've accepted three to six, we could do dominant three to six. So let me try that. You could do that, but then you take it the next step and use this concept of tritone substitution. Instead of playing C7, you play G flat 7. Chords of tritone apart, substituting for each other. Really common concept in jazz that I've known for decades, um, but I never thought about applying it that way. To take, to take the one chord and basically swap it into a three, make that three a dominant seven, then do a tritone substitution for it, all in one step. So that instead of landing on the one chord, we're landing on a flat seven chord. So I basically, it, that blew my mind when he did that. And, and of course, he's a bass player. He's not playing the full chord voicing. He just plays the G flat. That's all he plays. Um, so, uh, by the way, um, the... Uh, it takes a lot of work to be able to do that on the fly. Yeah, it kind of does. But on the other hand, I am talking to you right now, and I'm forming pretty much mostly grammatically correct sentences. Grammatically correct sentences. Correct is an adjective. Grammatically is an adverb. Modifies the word correct. That's a lot of calculation that had to go into saying, I talk good, or, you know, I'm making good I'm making good words. I, I don't right. There's all sorts of ways you could put words together that don't really make sense together. That but people would figure it out anyhow. To put together well constructed sentences takes an enormous amount of processing power in the brain, and yet we all do it. This kind of stuff is essentially the same. Yeah, it's incredible that we can do it. Just like it's incredible that I can say grammatically correct sentences. Um, <laughs> and say the word grammatically correct sentences while actually making grammatically correct sentences. Um, it's the same process. And so, yeah, it's a learnable skill, but, you know, one that you, you have to dedicate yourself to. So, uh, so what happened on that gig, again, is I played... I played an A-flat chord, but he put the G-flat on it. And as soon as he did that, I looked her over at him, and he just sort of smiled, like, yeah, that's a good chord there. And I thought about it and said, okay, and, the, and did, the, did the math in my head and saw why it worked. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got him next time. And so the next time through the song, we came to that same passage, and I go. And I play that and look over at him, and this time he plays the A flat. And he just laughs at me um, because, you know, whatever. It's it's just one of those things that happens. I heard him the first time and then said, okay, I'm going to do what you did. And he's like, yeah, I did it once. I'm not going to do it again. Um, but he recognized that it was that, yeah, um, that I had heard what he did and, and picked it up. And then he didn't do it the next time. And it, 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 it's just one of those moments that happens when you're working with musicians live, these sort of communication things that happen that, um, it's part of the joy of playing music live. So, uh, yeah, one of my favorite bandstand moments was the look on Paul's face um, as both of those things happened. When he put in the substitution and surprised me with it, and then when I when I met his substitution and he surprised me by not doing it the next time, it, it was just classic, priceless, and I will treasure both of those moments uh, all of my life. So um, one other thing about this song, by the way, um, it's 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 some of my favorite lyrics in the world, and 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 you know I talk so much about music, and say well the lyrics are there, and I uh, and occasionally talk about how oh because of this lyric I do this, but I, I want to mention just one of my favorite lyrics in that song. I wish I could remember. Um, do you know how a lost heart yearns for? I think I'm I think I'm mixing up two different lines in the song. But there's another part. Um, you don't know how hearts burn um, for love that Oh, wait a minute. For love that cannot live yet never dies. I think that's one of the greatest lyrics ever written. You don't know how hearts burn for love that cannot live yet never dies. So anyhow, chokes me up, but also I'm choked up thinking about Paul. 
So um, anyhow, hope you enjoyed this session. And, uh, you know, we looked at some SATB stuff. And we also got to talk about some harmonic things, which, of course, I love to talk about. I'm going to leave you with one uh, writing and make them free previews. So uh, you can just access those lessons to help you out as you try to do some SATB writing. And so I'll post links and stuff in the community. So if you're not already a member of the community, uh, by all means, go ahead and join. And uh, just be on the lookout for where I'm going to post some links to some free pre previews of the SATB lessons within the Harmony course and the uh, Counterpoint course. So with all that said, I'm going to uh, sign off here. Thanks everyone for being here and uh, hanging while we uh, talk about making music here. And uh, I do this every Thursday, have a ball doing it. I mentioned before that I'm not positive what the next uh, semester is going to bring as far as where I'm going to do this, how I'm going to do this because of what's going on teaching at school. But one way or another, this is going to be continuing. And uh, I'm looking forward to just all the music we're going to create. Keep writing SATB music. Keep writing any kind of music you want. Keep commenting on each other's music. Keep creating. Keep, uh, keep supporting other people. And uh, love you all. And uh, I'll... Talk to you next time. Bye.